started out as an oncology and practice forum. It's my fourth year attending this year. Um, it's basically a, a three-day event um, full of seminars, workshops and Q&As with industry professionals, all related to the voice. So, you know, there's many voice professionals. Um, it's basically a worldwide organisation, Vocology and Practices, um, which connect voice professionals of all types and all levels. Um, it's been a, an amazing um, resource for me as a, as a, as a vocal coach um, and for many others. And it's connected me with other voice professionals around the world, which is amazing. Um, my guest today is Kaya Hurstead. She is an award-winning singer-songwriter. She's a performer, an artist, a lecturer, a singing teacher, a mentor. She's a choir master and artist director of Threshold Festival. So we start off by talking about the, the Vocology in Practice weekend and she lets us know her thoughts. We finished the last one. There was already kind of, OK, we'll definitely want to do something like this for the next one. A little bit more balance between those seven principles, um, which I feel like I kind of got, yeah, managed to achieve in a certain way. And also kind of having the vision of I didn't want it to be too much about the pandemic and COVID. And, but instead going, OK, well, what would be useful tools for uh, teachers and voice practitioners to have so the tech mm -hmm. up, the um, you know the mental health and and well-being aspects and alignment and movement and all that kind of stuff yeah that was they, they were clever topics to kind of incorporate into the into the forum this year definitely I love myself that it's recorded because you know you can go back into it because some of the topics are a bit more complex so you kind of need to almost go back in and like revise it again and kind of just spend some time like letting it settle with you yeah and also I did do the um the option of going for just our sessions all the time uh well because last time we had some 90 minutes and some hours uh so instead we had hour plus hour for some sessions um and some of that worked and some of it made it challenging because um yeah there's some subjects that are harder to cover in an hour yeah. so yeah so I think I've kind of learned that if I'm going to do an hour plus hour I have to make sure the next one is also an hour plus hour because it kind of felt a bit unfair for those who wanted to catch both things. Yeah, I actually really liked the structure this year. I can't remember exactly what it was last year, but it felt a little bit more even and kind of like there was more, it was more split up. I liked the way there was kind of like, you know, one set kind of uh, pre presentation. Then there was, you could divide off into um, whatever two was in the next hour. And then you had like your 15 minute breaks. I think that kind of made a big difference. Yeah, there were there were all our sessions with 15 minutes and one for mm -hmm in the middle and I think yeah I'll probably keep that uh because last year we had some 90 minute sessions and then timing change and just because we also landed on daylight saving in LA yeah. so, yeah. that was a bit like <laughs> confusing for a few people exactly I was like I'm not going to get the times to change as well because it just so uh, I'm glad it, it seemed structured from the other end <laughs> No, it was it was brilliant. Like I, I still haven't watched all of them because I was work, working most of the day on Saturday and I was I, on Sunday. I missed the first couple as well, but I'll definitely get back into it. But um, just for people who like don't know like about vocology and practice, maybe you could like explain a little bit about that and what it is. Sure. So um, it's a network of voice specialists, uh, mostly voice teachers of and I say voice teachers because some of them might define singing teacher, vocal coaches, uh, you know, performance coaches, and then also some ENTs and SLPs. So uh, voice rehab, working um, with the voice in one way or another. Um, global, although the majority are in America, both South and, and North America, Canada, UK, Ireland. It's actually quite a big contingency of, uh, in, over the last couple of years, we've had a mm. Surge, uh, surgeon, surge, surge. A surgeon, I think. <laughs> <laughs> we have a big surgeon. Uh, we did have a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, um, and um, also a few from other places in Europe. Yeah, uh, two from Australia and four from Korea. Yeah, 
I'd have to look it up. But yeah, we were basically a network of education. So we're not a methodology. We are just sourcing, trying to stay in, on, at the forefront of new research, both in our within all of our seven principles, which is artistry, vocal pedagogy, body and mind, the holistic side, uh, musicianship. Or science. <laughs> yes. Anatomy. <laughs> and, yeah, anatomy. Also. Yeah, exactly. And business and personal development. Why does the world need vocology in practice? It's to connect uh, so that we don't all have to sit in our separate silos and, and work it all out for ourselves. Uh, instead, we're sharing. Uh, it's a peer network, so we're just all peers of different experience. Some of my mentors are in there being my peers as well as the, the people who have um, we don't have complete beginners we work with other organizations who do but but people who are you know really thirsty for knowledge and understanding that the more you know the less you know because <laughs> you just find out there's so much more to to be learned so we kind of make the really difficult stuff accessible for the person who may not be a researcher or a or specialists themselves, but we get, all of our members get an overview of all those important things to know within. Mm. Well, I I found it like to be a ama- uh, like a an amazing thing for my own progression as a as a singing teacher and now I would, would call myself more of a voice coach because I have learned so much about kind of the anatomy and the voice sign side of things which I, I didn't know any any of that before I didn't even know I needed to know but even as a, as a as a singer I found that for myself like years ago like the teachers didn't explain to you why you had to do things and I, I'm one of those people who, who needs to know the why because it has helped me connect with it more and and for as a singer it's helped me in that way but as a as a singing teacher and coach it has helped me just bring bring my teaching to the next level and it kind of and as you said it does connect you with other voice professionals so you can kind of gauge where you're at and maybe what you need to work on or maybe maybe even reveals your strengths as well so I think it's it's been really valuable in that sense so I'm very happy that I that I stumbled across it when I did. Awesome yeah was that cork for you? Um, actually, no, I went to the one in the UK, you know, the place you used to work in, the studio? Metropolis, yeah, in London. Yeah, in London. I went to, that was my first, I think that was, is that the second year it was running? Um, it was the second year it was in Euro. Was it the first time it was in Europe? It might have been the first time it was in Europe, actually. Um, yeah. but we had sessions in LA as part of Oakleyse U for a few years before that, I think 2015 was my first that I went to um, and there's been in San Francisco as well okay right yeah it might be the first one that we opened up outside of already members and you um you run BAST as well be a singing teacher which is a course I've also done um do you want to tell people a little bit about BAST and kind of what that is no I don't run it Lynn Hilton uh, yeah but I'm one of the trainers the teachers yeah mm. and uh, I tend to do about four to six courses per year I always meet some amazing singing teachers um usually it's either people who are kind of, kind of at the beginning to, to early career singing teachers or people who might feel like they need an update on the new things that are out there so like for instance somebody might have had a, a classical training and they're, they're finding that a lot of the clients are coming in as a CCM singers, which stands for uh, Contemporary Commercial Music, if anybody was wondering about that, or for instance, want to learn more about the anatomy and science, but might have come more from a performance um, background. Um, so that's, it's it's great. I mean, Lynn's done an amazing job of putting together the course. It's so comprehensive. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I love teaching it as well, because I always meet there's a lovely people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a lovely course. Like, I think I did it in 2000, the end of 2017, um but like it was the first time it was my my introduction to all all the voice science and the anatomy and all that and like you know I was kind of teaching more like you know style stylistic kind of performance coaching like basic warm-ups dynamics vocal health that kind of thing you know based more more on my experience as a, a singer and performer than anything else and I just I remember being asked to to teach um in a music school and I was kind of like I just didn't feel I felt like I wanted to know more 
like I took the job at the same time I was doing Bath. It just kind of happened to come at the same time. Um, but it was just, it was really brilliant. And it just opened me up to so many different resources to like, you know, help improve my own teaching, which was amazing. Um, so you're, yeah, so you're the voice, you're the voice coach and you, 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 you lecture as well, don't you, in the UK somewhere? Yeah, um, uh, several places. I mean, I'm, I'm back to being freelance now. So um, my, my recent kind of contract was at uh, ACM, the Academy of Contemporary mm-hmm. Music. I lectured uh, across the voice uh, there, but I also oversaw the creative artist course for a while, uh, which is a songwriting. I, I really like artist development as well. Mm-hmm. And then I've taught at Lippa in Liverpool, which is where I went and the reason why I came to England. Wow. Uh, yeah, and then I've taught at the University of Chester. I've uh, written and delivered material for Water Bear Education and Dime. I'm a principal songwriting tutor for Dime still. Uh, it's Dime, actually. I don't know Dime. I'm not familiar with it. Right, Institute of Music Education. <laughs> um, but they partner up with Rock School in the UK. Okay, yeah. So they do precision training. So it's... Um, yeah, it's it's kind of a modular program, so people can do one module at a time. So I teach on the songwriting modules and practitioner there. Yeah, and then I'm in yeah. at the moment, uh, my native Norway, but in Oslo, I'm from the north, really, um, and teaching at a musical theatre academy. And oh, wow. Kind of uh, helping, writing some new uh, study plans for how to uh, make sure that we stay current and because there's so much of the voice that, as you say, it's come been around not that long to kind mm-hmm. of to the, the plan for the students as well. I actually I was chatting to um Eric and Newt. I don't know if you saw I posted about that a while ago, and we were chatting a little bit about um musical theatre and kind of how like she was saying like when she was kind of first got into it years ago and that there wasn't really an understanding of the voice and you know there wasn't really much guidance in vocal technique or kind of how to care for your voice so it's really good to hear that it's starting to kind of infiltrate now into that area as well. Completely and and what is musical theatre now I mean yes there are some rules that make it different to pop but they're vocal stars they have to do everything from metal to you know maybe not metal but but definitely heavy rock and crunchy yeah. you know the Alanis Morissette musical and even all the musical like Rent and things it's basically alternative rock yeah a lot of the, yeah a lot of the newer musicals have really are kind of more they're more pop now really to you know it's it's not quite as kind of coming from a classical kind of background yeah, exactly, and it's like you can really find a difference within the, in the kind of uh, uh, way that the voice need for a vocalist. You can't just be doing legit musical theatre, and you can't just do that kind of Broadway jazz belt style. You you're expected to be quite versatile, and mm. so yeah, that's kind of, I do think that's quite exciting to kind of come in and. Um, I kind of do like working with those different styles. And... Yeah, and like kind of introducing them to some new ideas about the voice, which I am sure that they, they're they they're super excited to like to delve into that area. And you mentioned about a bit about songwriting and stuff like that. So I'm, I know that you're an artist. So may, you want to tell a little people about your band. It's, um uh, what's it called? Your band called again. I'm after blanking on the name of your band. I have it written down here somewhere. <laughs> the lamps yeah. <laughs> yeah so maybe tell us a little bit about your band yeah so I've been working uh it's it's not technically a band as such it's a collective of musicians so it's okay. a project I did, have, did started with a, um, a friend early on but we kind of parted ways in regards to so I've had loads of different collaborators uh, but uh, Science of the Lamps we call it a vaudeville pop yeah so. <laughs> I love yeah. it I, I was I was listening to it earlier today like it's it's really yeah I love the vaude that vaudeville style so nice thank you but well, I just love harmonies so it's like how can I just constantly have anything in for the part harmony then okay I need to have backing vocalists <laughs> and then you know we like doing kind of little show things so we'll have a little bit of a theme and um done shows kind of places I like making events that are kind of unmissable and 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 special rather than um 
just gigs and I'm, I'm saying just gigs very much in a like I love going to gigs as well but I think I was kind of a little bit tired of the same kind of gig circuit so I think doing stuff in a cinema or in a in tunnel entrance and stuff like that I've, I like being with <laughs> yeah no I love that I think I think that's kind of what why you stand out as you know as well because you kind of have a quirkiness about you and you know I think you're what you're really doing is you're kind of creating like a different environmental experience for people as well do you know like people can actually ha- experience it as opposed to just go and listen it's I think that's you know that's cool that makes it stand out and, and that's what gets people talking about your music as well do you know if you really they'll go away talking about how the how the it made them feel you know yeah the irony is we're gonna have the the kind of final gig last year uh, as part of threshold festival the second of april 2020 uh, <laughs> the final gig yeah uh, but obviously that didn't happen um so i did because I'm, I'm kind of moving into a slightly different i'll revisit it as, as well but um um, I was just finding that I don't really want to be running a band with people and, and, and management and, and things like that. I want to kind of explore a little bit more. But it's been a decade with Science of the Lamps, so um, it's kind of felt like a good time. Um, well, it was nine years last year, so 10 years this year. So obviously there hasn't been any performances through the last year, so that was uh, we didn't get to do the big finale gig, so we'll yeah. work with that. So I'm wondering, obviously you have dedicated like much of your, your life to studying the voice. And I'm wondering, like, what has been your, some of your biggest vocal influences? And I don't just mean like artists, but even maybe techniques or and it could be anything that's influenced your, your voice or kind of kind of brought you in a new direction or kind of helped you elevate your style. Good question. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm doing, I'm looking, if anybody's um, interested in, in doing some co-writing, I'm basically thinking like I want to try and explore outer avenues and everything. And I think anytime you work with collaboratives that, that does influence your vocal choices and your songwriting choices and everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, growing up, I listened to um, a lot of the music that my parents listened to, which was like the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and all those kind of 60s and 70s things um and I didn't probably realize how much that influenced me until I started studying songwriting Mm -hmm. Uh, I was more of a grunge girl in the in the in the middle bit so it was like kind of music from before 1980 and then uh uh, a lot of Pearl Jam and Nirvana and and that kind of thing as I was growing up Mm -hmm. um and and Jewel uh, was kind of one of those where I I was like, well, I really like the strip down and I started listening more to a kind of alternative folk. Uh, from your island, love Damien Rice. It's one of my favorites. That kind of storytelling and and melancholy. And I, I often say I, I write <laughs> I write uh, melancholic songs so I can be a happy person. <laughs> <laughs> love it. It's cathartic. <laughs> if people kind of just listen to my lyrics and don't meet me as a person and know about kind of like the general gist of who and what I am then uh, they probably think I'm really <laughs> depressed, depressed <yeah. laughs> but it is like I honestly don't think I would be as together as I am if it, I didn't have some writing um but also things like you know studying with like Dave Stroud f- helped me find my kind of whatever you want to call them middle register where I got an octave and a half extra of a full voice and obviously not just him but like finding that was like the oh okay there's more of this acoustic stuff can really do mm. amazing things and um, my singing teachers growing up even though I had more like classical lessons and I didn't I kind of just felt like oh, I have to do this song and I went home and sang everybody hurts or whatever um <laughs> I feel pretty. So and um, and then I actually still love doing musicals when I was in my my teens and everything. And I was always in local shows and musicals. So um, I, I love the drama of delivering a story right across genres. I love lyrics like Johnny Mitchell's lyrics or Counting Crows or 
you know, that kind of thing. And then I, I actually now really like pop as well. And like, you know, 20 year old myself would be really disappointed. <laughs> yeah. <So cool. laughs> but now I just love a, a good artist that are like just living their authentic artistry, whatever that is. And if that's really poppy or if that's really heavy, I kind of see great things. A great song is a great song right across. I adore Nina Simone. That's been a mm. massive influence. Um, just with that kind of idea that you can throw away notes and um and, and really play with with dynamics. Um uh, yeah, I, I love, as I said, I've said loads of people. Have I said loads of people? You have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's great though. I, I love um I just love hearing, you know everybody's influences because people sometimes surprise you and say things that you wouldn't expect them to say as well which is really cool I actually got I obviously heard the vaudeville theme throughout your 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 music but uh, I also got a little bit of like like 90s kind of female rock like um, Alanis Morissette kind of type thing as well in there big and I think there wasn't that many out you know in the olden days there wasn't that many and Janis Joplin and, and Alanis Morissette and Skin from Skunk and Nancy um, they were kind of the, there was a few other people like Four Non Blondes and, and things that kind of came and went, but there weren't that many role models if you were somebody who wanted to do uh, less of a um, tweet. Extreme. I don't mean that, in, like I love New Folk and, and, you know, a first aid kit and everything. Like I like really minimalistic music as well, but like, um, something with real punch in the voice and, and like it, dynamics is the big big word <laughs> I always yeah. said the big, you know, it's like that's just just not sound correct <laughs> yeah and like speaking of dynamics let's talk about your style menu so maybe you could tell people what your style menu is first and then it maybe it might be nice to talk about how this people could use the style menu maybe in a recording studio setting or maybe in like pre-production for going into recording studio or you know preparing for gigs that kind of thing so the style menu basically was uh, something I created for um, in, in 2016, some of 2016, we had the Vocal Gym Practice um, Network. Uh, we had the summer teacher training, I think we just call it then. It wasn't like as, um, it wasn't as conferency. It was more kind of loads of people sharing and everything, but I learned so much. And they said, oh, can you do something about style and artistry? And I had been working, I was at Uni at Chester then, and I had an, a master's student who came from a classical background. And uh, she was very, very good at doing things exactly as is on the paper, on the dots, as written. And improvisations were either something she would have to sit and write, like from I'm going to do it over this mode or I'm going to improvise over this scale or um, it would be something that she just didn't do or took from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So just giving her a new set of rules and that's how it started. And because I like puns, I <laughs> then designed it into, okay, left side is more vocal habilitation, so vocal training and um, technique. And then the right side is is kind of prompts and ideas of how to um approach something so it'll have yeah so larynx position um which so everything neutral tends to be the healthiest starting point i'm sure many of your listeners will already know this but like neutral is often where you land if you go oh oh and be basically where i'm there and some styles have a lower larynx and some styles have a higher larynx i'm doing a little bit from my mouth as well too uh, make them extreme so they both will affect muscle work and also obviously timbre or the acoustic overtone how you boost everything there and onsets are the way we attack the note uh, so some will call them at the attack of the note but they're called onsets and there are little kind of different ways of attacking again the neutral would be where the voice where the airflow comes at exactly the same time as as, as the vocal folds come together so like a uh, quite balanced uh, onset 
easiest to get that one is if you do like a W first. Ooh, almost like a O. Mm. And the two kind of outer ends of, you hit quite a lot in pop, the aspirate onset. Oh, like Billie Eilish uses that all the time. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. The airflow comes first and then the book falls together. And the glottis attack or the heart attack uh, will be like the ah, uh, ah. Uh, um, and for them, the vocal fold are kind of closing before the airflow comes to push them apart. And you can kind of slide onto things and you can... Um, Creak your way into an old crowd, baby, baby, right? <laughs> Bit of Brittany. Brittany. So um, um, then you have the compression of the vocal folds. And so many people have never thought of these things to be something you could improvise with, right? They're technique stuff. But mm. it is different. If I go, you know, you've got the... <laughs> Should think of a song. Should have thought of a song before. So we like. Um, oh yeah. Okay. So if I got when I find myself in times of trouble, right, kind of straight without much. Mm-hmm. Oh, we'll be brought to there because clearly tarty. Um, <laughs> I can go with a when I find with like more of an airy, or I can go mm-hmm. when I. Um, obviously, with that song, I wouldn't do either of those extreme. Mm-hmm. Um, but like from weak to kind of medium and then kind of stronger into kind of excessive um, vocal fault compression. And that has a lot to do. And then it's the vowels where you're shaping them in the mouth. So I can shape, uh, I can shape, I can't say the word, per, so I, I, I can uh, create a lot of uh, vowels without uh, using my lips and my jaw but I can't do m and b and p and v and everything else that are kind of more front vowels mm. uh, but that would really change the sound if I go I'm not changing anything down here I'm not adding more volume but some of them naturally have different boosts you're changing and, the shape of the cave yeah exactly <laughs> and uh, and I know some of you might have heard me say this before, but you got the small dog woof, woof, and the big dog, woof, woof, or the cello versus the violin. The, the smaller the space, the more higher frequencies get boosted, and the bigger the space, the lower. So we can kind of play with that in a way where we're being artistic and we can shape this space. So I can have like a kind of high larynx with loads of space in my mouth that's the kind of quite a lot of pop singers now you know um and then i can do the opposite where i might have a lower larynx but a wide small small space in the mouth a trumpet strategy like long there and so there's so many strategies you can do from a mm. stylistic point of view and i love listening to things at a lower tempo so that, um, you know, yeah. you can really hear what they do. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, that's the vibrato. is just like, ah, when you hear it slow. And you, you're not aware that it's just like actually a full semitone. Yeah, it kind of, um, yeah, I love doing that as well, slowing songs down, because it also kind of just gives your body a chance to like kinesthetically feel what's happening too. Sometimes it just takes a moment to actually kind of, feel it when you're doing it so fast sometimes you can't and you you kind of notice the detail when you slow it down you notice what's happening more completely and then on the right side it's all kind of artistic things like phrasing and doing yes and oohs and melody change changing the octaves uh, melismas and ad libs and improvisation riffs runs um, and I haven't specified what that is because I that would be so individual for like how a, a singer thinks yeah so um and it's great to kind of em- emulate before you create in a way so could you g- I'm putting you on the spot here now so don't worry if you can't think of something but could you give an example of a song and how you might change it stylistically to kind of make it more yours with by you changing the rhythm of it oh yeah okay yeah and, and, and actually rhythm is one of those things that people don't often think about 
So let's do let it be again, just for each. most people have heard that. So if the, the, the real rhythm is when I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me. I should have turned on the original sound. But yeah, so that's the standard rhythm. I could just even go when I find myself in times of trouble. It's more six eight, right? Yeah, I am going six eight. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. So that, I mean, that's a drastic rhythm change in many ways, but. Joe Cocker did it for with the help from my friends when he covered the song. You know, instead of what did you do when it sang out of tune is what did you do? So that's one way. But I can stay within the original when I found uh, the original uh, four four rhythm and I can go when I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me. And yes, I, I did a little trill as well, but that would definitely make it a different style. And yes, That's if- lovely. And <laughs> like it, it happened there when you as well. But like by changing one element, it might actually influence how you end up singing it as well. Te- technically, just what happened to you there, you just automatically put in a trill because it kind of worked in the new rhythm, which I think is so lovely. Like cause you don't even know what's going to happen, but it comes. Exactly. And, and the thing with improvisation and, and stylistic elements is like you've got to be in that creative space. And like some people refer to left brain, right brain, but we know it's more inter changeable nowadays but it's still like some signals in your brain have a tendency to to put on the brakes for creativity and some have a tendency to open up the floodgates of magic (laughs) what would you say to somebody who's who's quite stuck in their head about like trying to get the technique perfect and they just are so tunnel visioned on that that they just they can't find their style they can't find their their voice they can't kind of be free because of that Right. So there's two things there. Actually, there's three things. <laughs> One of them, it, what's their goals? Because for some people, the goal might be to be a technician and to to just, you know, I'm a student-centered teacher so if a, or a client-centered teacher. If, like, if, it's, if someone comes in and say, I just want to sing like blah, 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 blah. And I go, are you sure that they are, they're already around? Um, and they go, yeah, that's my goal. And unless they are on a course where the goals, the goal is is something else, I might have mm-hmm. seen a bit of that. But then we'll work, and we'll we can work just technically. But with the majority of students, the goal is going to be either I want to be a versatile singer, or it's going to be I want to have a lot of authenticity and my own individual style. Um, and if you're a person who want to have a lot of individual style but have been thinking like a technician, then there's an element of, of, of process that needs to be, like the, the practice needs to change a little bit or added another set of, of rules. And, and this is basically part of the reason for creating the style menu. Because, mm-hmm. you know, if I, um, if I'm, I, I can't push anybody to be creative, but if they want to find their own style, it is, by doing exercises and being a little bit less afraid of making mistakes. You just tried something else and it didn't work. You didn't make a mistake, right? Yeah. And um, and remembering it's called playing music. Nobody dies from you singing. Uh, if you're singing something that didn't work with a chord underneath, you tried something else that didn't work. And maybe it was a flat nine <laughs> because you landed on the wrong chord and and stuff like that. But the more you do it, the more um, things you'll have in your bank, your natural natural or attained bank of improvisational tricks and riffs. And, and the imperative thing is just to listen. And would you say in your experience at working with singer is that um, that it would be the more kind of singer songwriter artist style vocalist who would want to engage more with the finding your own style than someone who's kind of more like session vocalist back and vocalist that kind of thing well um depends again what they do so it's like it depends it's gonna be <laughs> um so like a session singer who's singing across loads of genres um and doing backing vocals for loads of different artists will have to be super flexible so they are usually quite open to learn loads of improvisation, learn loads of different style, but maybe less 
um, or should be less interested in having a calling card as their voice, because unless you are the person who work with people who want exactly that voice. So there are some session singers who will get hired because they deliver that particular voice. Um, mm -hmm. but most people, um, if you're coming in and doing sessions, it, you're probably more either background or demoing, or you might be asked, oh, can you do it a bit more like Sia? Or can you do it a bit more like Kelly Clarkson? And, and you kind of have to respond to what the producer says in a way. Yeah, so like, because the way I view your style menu is, um, I think obviously both both types of vocalists can can benefit from this because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, a session vocalist or someone who's doing back and vocals um, for another artist, they, they need to have an understanding of their voice. So they need to have kind of like a repertoire or a menu of different stylistic things they can try out to help them achieve whatever the artist that they're working for is asking for. And then for like, you know, like the singer songwriter artist type, you know, by trying out these different things on your menu, they might somewhere kind of realize, oh, this is evoking an emotion that I that I didn't know I could portray in my voice or, you know, help me tell the story better. So I think it's it's although it's kind of structured, it's kind of it's kind of like um a painter's palette in a way. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah, that absolutely. And and I use other tools as well. But this, I use this but mostly for people who either need more rules in their improvisation and when they go to music theory rules they might get stuck doing the really obvious. So mm -hmm. you, your music theory knowledge needs to be so vast before you can vary between all the different, that's really advanced to be able to kind of jump from a, you know, major scale to a Phrygian mode to a um, bit of a blue scale to, do, but like that might come out completely naturally by you going, I'm going to go up here. I'm going to uh, mm -hmm. do it. I'm gonna do a flip and then all of a sudden you're suddenly jumped around and some of it will work and some of it might not but you might come up with things that you wouldn't have created if you were to do it from a music theory angle yeah I actually I didn't get to watch your your workshop was it with Amy mm -hmm. I didn't get to watch that but I I, I assume that this is kind of kind well, of yeah. yeah, going into that that workshop, I'm looking forward to um to watching it. But, but um, what was I going to say? So, if you were, you know, if if um, say like a singer was preparing for the recording studio, or whatever, the the best plan would probably be, you know, in pre production or kind of like in the months running up to it, is to start like trying out these things and like seeing if you can achieve them and like you know access new qualities for the recording like or how would you like coach a singer into getting the best out of their voice in the studio how would you use the style menu to do that maybe yeah um, and I think you said a, a important word earlier that most of the time that would be in pre-production because some vocal choices might need the development of of actual um habilitation and muscle work and you know I, I tell my students all the time I can show you how to do a sit-up you're not going to automatically get a, a six-pack um, yeah. you know it's some of it you need to do it again and again and again you know ah that happens to me okay ah that happens okay and ah uh, okay that will inform each other but if I do that again tomorrow without adjusting my vowel, then that will go back to flipping because that muscle memory isn't there on that vowel. I'm being yeah, so it's, not, it's not the kind of thing that you just want to leave till the day of the studio and like try things out in the studio. because You're just going to waste time and money, right? Time is money, especially in the big studios. If you're kind of hanging out doing a writing session, that's a whole different story. But if you're in a studio recording with... And especially if a label or management or whatever have paid for it and you, you can't really be in there. And so um, I would work on it in advance. But if I'm coming in with a, a session voc uh, as a, a vocal producer and kind of working, trying to get the right thing out of it, I might still use elements of this as well, where I'm, um, I might do things. So we, can you do this with a, a different kind of intention? Can you do this with a different setting but in pre-production I, I will play a lot more with it 
because mm. through play you might come up with the less obvious things uh basically yeah and um like there's there'll be a lot of like producers who will try to like coach the the singer and they may not be co- like vocal coaches themselves but they may try to help the singer achieve a sound or try something out so you know that's just another reason to to like uh, you know dig into the voice and like learn how to create all these sounds so that if they're trying to say to you can you sound like this or sound like that that you know how to access the sound you know completely and and, and they will say things like okay can you make it a bit warmer and then you need to have the knowledge to to kind of know, know what that means yeah and okay so we're talking about bigger space then okay do they want it warmer in this space or in this space because we have two main spaces so mm-hmm. if i was singing ooh, 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 and that was like the line and they go can you make that warmer I might try to go a little bit more oh in my ooh, mm-hmm. ooh, 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 just to kind of, and if they go, um, no, I don't, I don't mean it like that. And then, you know, sometimes they come out with, with things that I just mean like, oh, no, I'm always friendlier. And you're like, okay, you're friendlier coming up. <laughs> and then you like make a, a decision what that means to you as you might Ooh, ooh. <laughs> and, you, and, and it's just loads of different things but no there is no kind of one you know they might say oh it's a bit pitchy can you um can you do it again not pitchy and that's like the kind of thing that's so easy to get really upset about and mm. helps you move away from you know because what does pitchy mean does it mean you're not boosting the right performance in your vocal track um uh, which is a energy boosts or does it mean that you actually pitch it wrong and mm. it's very hard to know when you're working they don't have time for that they have time to say um uh, let's do one that was a bit pitchy in the middle and then you just have to go again and you know that it's it's not an artistic process really in 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 the studio it's a what do i have of tools mm-hmm that I can react to. It's a very reactive. Or have been for me. Obviously, I don't have all the answers. Yeah. And um, you you kind of, when you were doing one of the demonstrations there, you you, could, you were like smiling and you were kind of like, I could tell you were like, there was more of a connection to the lyric there and a more delivery of a story or an emotion. So does that, I suppose, that side of things would influence how you deliver the sh- quality as well? Absolutely. And, you know, there are certain primal things we can say that that kind of like, you know, there's certain things you will hear. If I put a bit of cry or whatever you want to call it at the back, that might come across as more melancholic. If instead of doing it here, I'm singing the same notes, I'm singing it in the same compression. Right. Yeah. And You're just tweak, tweaking it and shaping it. Right. And the more flexible you can make your vocal instrument, the more fun you can have in your artistic um, process, really. So, like, if I want to go, if I want to go, I love you, I can do that. But if a flip comes out and you wanted to go, I will let you, then you don't want the flip. So, by by kind of getting this palette as you referred to earlier you don't have to have just the blue and the red you have everything in between and and you stop having the limitations for what you want to hear in your head as an artist and that's I mean for me that's the super fun bit of going do I want la la or do I want la or la or la you know yeah yeah I, I I was I really enjoyed um the workshop by Jules D- Giselle um she was like a a voice over artist I think she she her her title is so like although she's not a singer as such she has to you know understand her voice very well to achieve different emotions and I think you said something about having fun with it and you know I think it is fun when you try to like put on voices like when you put on a voice you're not you know you're you're having fun you're just you know you're messing or you're you're trying to portray a character whatever and I think um to do that as well you need to be able to understand the voice quality that portrays that emotion you know even on a on a on a speaking level and trust your instincts you know if you are angry with someone you don't go I'm going to come over and be really loud at you 
but like <laughs> that's something that uh, that can happen that is a product of your intention and actually sometimes loud might not be it might just be really intense and quiet <laughs> and like yeah. they think about it, feelings as oh i'm gonna go really loud here because i'm i'm angry it's like that's not how the body works the body tone and and, and voice production so much of it is, is instinctual and like if you're holding a baby you don't have to focus very much not to go like you're on it <laughs> <laughs> it's right in the side over my <laughs> And if so, you can notice it. Um, you know, it's it's that kind of thing of uh, yes. What's the intention behind it? Right? And the intention will lead the timbre and the volume. And I think if you think about, that's why I don't like so much when we are describing the voice as something, a sound. Oh, you sound really blah blah blah. Or you sound really. It's important for us to kind of think of that sound but if you just listen to a singer's oh you got such a lovely voice it's like well how can you use that you can't mm -hmm. you know what is lovely about it and yeah rambling now <laughs> no not at all it, but it's i think what you're trying to say is like we need we need to be specific in the choices that we make whether that be you know playing around with vocal technique that will help us achieve it or whether that means that we, we we know what we're talking about as we're singing so that we're emotionally connected and we have the right intention yeah and direction you know who are you singing to what are you trying to achieve with this is it just a like telling telling a story about somebody else or are you getting your own emotions out and that that's going to be a you know are you i think for a lot of people just singing to your own 15 year old self can be a great kind of way of connecting to material so uh, like yeah that kind of idea so sometimes it is just going do it up the octave or do it down at the end or um take away the vibrato and obviously depending on where the the student is some of these things are gonna help with technique as well other things are just gonna be um, stylistic elements and I with everyone and this is right across from my metalheads through to my musical theatre singers and everything in between I talk about the magical triangle uh, and the magical triangle um, you might have seen it on the pathway I can't remember if I included it uh, as one of my presentations but but there one of them is learning the song knowing the lyrics knowing the rhythm knowing uh, the notes one of them is, is your body prepared? Do you have the technique? Do you, are you literally well? Have you eaten today? Have you slept this week? Are you hormonal? All of this, the kind of thing. And then final bit is knowing the journey of the song and what do you want to say with it and delivering it with intention and conviction. And like, if any of these three things are missing, then the magic falls out, basically. I love that. That's that's a really nice uh, way to kind of summarize it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so um, do you have any workshops coming up or is there anything that people that you want people to check out after they hear this? Yeah. So um, with singing theory, um, you can go to on Insta if you're on Instagram, singing.theory. Um, we have a workshop, a full day of improvisation, and there's three workshops. And the first one is going to be Introduction to Improvisation. And it is very much a beginner's workshop. However, we are um, uh, doing the voice science and the music theory of improvisation. So for teachers, for instance, that could be um, with a few tips of how to um, do exercises for a beginner. And then we're doing an intermediate, which goes a little bit more geeky, probably similar, lots of it is similar to what you will see in the workshop from Saturday. And then we've got an advanced one where we go even more kind of deeply into both the musical theory ele element and the voice science and looking more at um, spectrograms and, and graphs and things, a bit more research-based. Uh, well, everything's research and practice-based, I could say. So that was on the 15th of May. Um, I do private lessons, although I don't really do them until um, later on this year because I'm, I'm, I'm quite busy with the academy. And you can contact me on kayamusic.com. Uh, I'm kayamusic on 
Instagram and Facebook and most other things, I think. Uh, check out Science Lamps. A, I think that's what called you practice past teaching. Yeah, I'll put all the, all your links anyway into the description. Um, but the, the workshop sounds great, actually, really great. I actually would be interested in that, depending on when it's on. Mm -hmm. um, but also i'll put a link to your to your music as well so people can kind of just kind of see where you're coming from from an artistic um perspective i suppose but um yeah so thanks so much that was great yeah but thank you so much for having me <laughs> and yeah, you're welcome.